Okay, cool. And then, so uh, thanks everyone for, for giving up some of your time tonight. Uh, it's a very, very early morning for Michel over in Belgium. I think it's about 5 a.m. And, and he was the one who was hounding me to get this started at uh, 4.30, his local time. So uh, we've been having a, a pretty rich discussion and a, and a great conversation there before this. Uh, and just wanted to, to quickly introduce him. He's, uh, he's an innovator. He's a pioneer. He's, uh, he's a teacher, a scientist, and a football coach as well. Um, he's consulted with some of the top clubs in the world. He's consulting with other sports, with education systems, and, and his methods seem to be proving uh, incredibly rewarding uh, by focusing on the brain and, and mental training within sports. So I know that that didn't do your work, Michelle, any justice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass it over to you and, uh, and let you take it away. And thanks so much for, for joining us this evening. Okay, you're welcome and uh, hello to all the coaches who, who are going to assist the uh, meeting or the webinar. Uh, okay, as Jordan already said, I'm, I'm uh, involved in many things, not only uh, sports at the grassroots and a professional level, then I talk about soccer. Uh, also in the school system, tennis, uh, there are other uh, sports uh, coming in as well, uh, field hockey, and next for next season, also one of the top 10 uh, skiers in the world. Uh, but it all, it all goes about uh, neuroscience. So now let's see. Okay. I already, I already uh, presented my ideas in uh, 24 countries and i had to luck to to meet uh, many important people in football uh, to give you an idea uh, about i think it it is now about seven eight years ago i was invited by real madrid and i could train the first team together with uh, jose Mourinho, and then barcelona came in and as you can see other big uh, big clubs roma benfica but at a particular moment, I, uh, I was invited by AC Milan and I was their consultant advisor during three, three years. Knowing that uh, Milan Lab is, is, uh, is well known all over the world. After Milan, uh, I changed to, to another country, <clears throat> Met, and there it repeated itself three seasons together with uh, they have uh, an academy in Senegal, Generation Food, that delivered Koulibaly, uh, Sadio Mane. And again, the story repeated in, uh, itself. Then uh, I was invited by Lugano in Switzerland. And again, it took some time, but I could convince uh, many coaches, uh, not only uh, in the club, but also in the whole of the province Ticino to rethink a little bit their programs. And uh, again, we could prove, we could prove that it can have a tremendous influence on, on uh, the development of young players. Today, I'm a, I'm a consultant advisor for Chinese football. I'm involved in the Math Academy project in Saudi Arabia. That will be the biggest project, uh, sports project in the world. Uh, Arabian world, why? Because I was also one year uh, one of the managers of uh, the Aspire Academy. But it's simply to give you an idea that uh, I really, I really was uh, passionate by uh, passionated by, uh, by what I'm, I'm doing. And I try to, to, to pass it to other people all over the world. That's to give you uh, a small idea. Now, uh, the physical condition, I don't believe in that. So physical condition for himself don't exist from my point of view. So the mind is control everything. The, what do you have to do on the pitch when you have the ball, when you don't have the ball? How you defend the set pieces, many, many circumstances and not about the physical. So they are young, they train every day, we take care of them. That is impossible in terms of the physios, the, the older departments that we have. Uh, 
absolutely everything for them. So uh, I don't believe in that. So why the first half was low, the second half were uh, so quick and were so aggressive, you know? Mm-hmm. It could be the opposite. So when you're tired, it's always a mental approach. So when you listen to Guardiola, he is actually confirming what I tried to, to explain to coaches. But perhaps the message is rather hard. Uh, the fact he's telling, I don't believe in physical condition. This doesn't mean that physical condition is not important. But he is right when he tells us it all goes about the mind, the brain. And to give you an idea, uh, I had, so when I was working for Milan, Guardiola was in the background because at that moment he was uh, working in Germany. So my team could exchange ideas with him, him and he confirmed what we were doing. Now, if you look to uh, a few of the top players, uh, their opinion about the influence of the brain, you take Xavi Hernandez. Well, he, he states, uh, okay, uh, most of the players, he players he played against were quicker and stronger, but his uh, decision-making, he compares it with uh, his mental top speed mm, uh, is 200 compared compared with the others, they only have 80. And he always tried to to reach 200. Uh, He says, I understand football as space, time. If there is space, you have time to think and you become very dangerous. And it's also confirmed by Andrea Pirlo. Football is played with the head, your legs, and just uh, are just the tools. And it's a coincidence because my colleague, the technical director of uh, the Youth Academy of Milan, became actually the assistant of Mr. Allegri. I also met him in Milan. Uh, when Allegri was the coach of Juventus. And we, so we got the opportunity to, to introduce uh, my ideas in the training sessions of the, the first team of Juventus. And so Pirlo uh, experienced it and he said, this is unbelievable. I, I, I didn't know things like that could happen. So it's to give you, it's to give you an idea that new things are coming in and actually it goes about speed speed is often confused with inside side when i what savi is telling us when he starts running uh, he starts running earlier than the others and that gives the impression that he is faster now we thought perhaps a few of the the absolute top stars can tell can can tell all that but then we go to table tennis and we we check for instance what uh, Desmond Douglas one of the best uh, English table tennis players ever well uh, he, he impressed everyone by his lightning fast reactions now at a particular moment scientists were going to to measure his muscle response time his reactivity Normally, we can go to 200 milliseconds. And they found out that he had the lowest uh, muscle response uh, time of all the English uh, table tennis players. Now, what was the explanation? They wanted to find an answer. And they found out that his speed, speed comes out of his brain. He recognizes immediately the relevant visual signals to predict the trajectory of the ball. So that uh, puts us on the road of neuroscience. If we we join what's happening today in Germany, I think you all know that the new coach of uh, Bayern Munich is going to be Julian Nagelsmann. Uh, Bayern Munich paid 25 million euros to contract him. And Julian is actually all, also someone belonging to the, the new wave in football. He tries to increase the, the cognitive speed in his players, allowing players to react faster to a changing situation on the field. As a result, the, tra- the brain is trained more than the feet and the legs. So a little bit theory. Uh, And then one of the questions uh, that comes in immediately is, do we memorize what we are learning? Because memorizing is building up expertise. And this is something not only uh, to be aware of in, in the sports environment, but also at school. So 
in my concept, we call it MBM, we first want to know how do we learn? And neuroscience in football, the tip of the, of the veil, will, will make it possible to understand it in a better way. So MBM is developing the intelligent player, and that means playing faster and thinking faster. Now, neuroscience in football, then we need to understand that the input determines the out, output. Certain information is already present. Uh, very few people are aware that when a baby arrives in this world, it's not a blank slate. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable. He already understands he is in the world. He, he already uh, knows that the, the world is full of people. Uh, he knows numbers. Uh, he can count. Uh, uh, he, he can use probabilities. We thought, we thought there was nothing in his brain. And now through research, uh, we begin to understand that he is already programmed to be part of the world. So it's very important that we first check that the brain is sufficiently organized to learn in an optimal way uh, what we offer a child. So it is important to screen uh, a young kid's brain because more and more, this has been a, a fight for many years between nature and nurture. Uh, more and more, the myth of the innate talent is going down. Now, the processing of the information that arrives in the brain must proceed according to the functioning of the brain. And this is something we are missing in our, in our educational system. They explain to us many programs, but they forget us to explain how the uh, human processor is working. And watch out, the output is often influenced by the brain. So the brain is actually making his own, his own image of the world. It's not, it's not always 100% is matching with reality. That's something we need to be aware of. To give you an idea, our fallible thinking and I'll, I'll take an example of a visual cognitive, a visual illusion. Uh, how the brain, without often being aware of it, creates a different picture of the external world. When you look to this picture, and I ask you to concentrate on the two circles in the center, you will see it gives you the impression that the one at the left is smaller than the one at the right. Uh, the explanation is the left one surrounded by big circles, uh, becomes smaller, the right one surrounded by uh, small circles becomes uh, bigger. So you do not see with your eyes, you see with your brain. And you can try whatever you want. Now, if you want to measure it, you will find out that the two uh, circles in the middle are, uh, are having the same size. But you cannot, you cannot uh, suppress or you cannot uh, ignore what you're seeing. Now, Okay, uh, many people think that something in the background, what uh, does this uh, uh, has to do with, with sports? Now we go to sports and uh, a few of my colleagues organized uh, a test and they wanted to show the influence of the divergent image. And as Johan Cruyff many times says, every disadvantage sometimes becomes an advantage. We do the same. We actually use uh, projectors and we, uh, we project big circle, circles around the, the small hole you have to use to put in golf. And again, you will see that when the circles are big, the, the hole becomes smaller. When you put uh, smaller circles, the hole gives the impression to, to become uh, bigger or uh, yes, to become big, bigger, to say it in that way. So uh, what, was, what was the result? You can already guess it. The scoring percentage in the first hole was 10 percentage higher, simply because the way a number of players uh, looked to, to, to the hole was different. It's not only, it's not only uh, in that environment that the brain uh, can surprise us. Uh, 
now we go to a cognitive illusion. Uh, what you see here is uh, this was a setup in a meeting room uh, in the school during uh, a rest. Teachers could drink uh, a coffee or a tea. And there was a picture on, on the wall uh, in front of the table uh, where there was a, a ball. Uh, teachers could uh, throw in some money to contribute to uh, a charity project. As long as uh, the picture uh, contained flowers, the contribu contribution was very low. Then, uh, after a few days, they changed the, the picture by uh, a lady with stern eyes, and suddenly more money came in. So the adapted input determines the output and unconsciously influences your decisions. You will not believe me that I can give you thousands of examples. Nobody is aware of this, this. To give you an idea, if it's cold outside, your opinion will be completely different uh, when uh, it will be hot or warm outside. So without being, without being uh, aware of all that, the, the brain is influencing our, our life. It's the same if the sun is shining in, uh, in New York, the stocking market will be different. Not based on uh, rational thinking, simply because uh, it comes out of the brain. It is, it is a kind of mindset that uh, influences all your decisions. Now, what can disrupt, slow down, and misrepresent the information processing of the brain of a child, a player. First of all, when you arrive in this world, we, we are uh, poor creatures. We cannot move, we cannot walk around, but we first, we first have to rely on reflexes. Now, if uh, a, a number of those reflexes, residues of reflexes stay, stay in, your, in your brain, this will cause learning problems uh, some years later. We now know, and I was involved in research, that at the age of seven, eight years old, uh, children still having reflexes in their brain, they will uh, struggle at school. This has got nothing to do with intelligence, intelligence because the moment we can uh, help them and we put them in a, in a small program, let's say after six weeks, the problem is gone the influence of stress. Then another thing, the lack of cooperation between the hemispheres, the two parts of the brain. If the interaction between, between those two parts is not well organized, well, uh, it will influence the development of a child. The delayed biological and mental maturity, a problem already present for many, many years in the sports environment. The, the fact they always give priority to physical stronger players. Then emotional disorders. Uh, there are so many uh, today. And this is connected with the first uh, years of uh, living in this world. Because if, uh, to give you an idea, if a baby does not have a uh, gaze exchange with the mother, well, this can cause a lot, a lot of problems uh, later on. And th these are the things we are not aware of because the first few years, and then I completely joined my, my friend and colleague, Tom Bayer, who developed the program Football Starts at Home. Watch out for this because he is right. We know scientifically today he is right. The first four, five, six years of a human being's life are going to determine what, uh, what will hap happen later on. Poor brain timing. Another part that was something I uh, specialized in because I developed uh, SenseBall. Actually, it was based on, on uh, soccer, but uh, in, a, in a neuroscience way. Uh, when, when I uh, developed Sun's Ball, today we call it MBM Ball because in the near future uh, we will make it possible to measure more. There will be sensors in it. Uh, it will give us more feedback regarding 
uh, all the performances. But the brain, brain timing is fundamental for all motor and cognitive processes uh, in the brain. Also, another, also something very important, uh, we, we are not aware of this, the chronotype, because we have an individual biological rhythm. So not all the children, when they arrive on the pitch, will have the same energy, because the energy is determined by their biological rhythm. That's the reason why in Europe, and I think it's happening all over the world, they start changing the uh, the hour uh, the courses are, are starting in, in schools. Then what is in the middle of interest today, weak executive functions, especially cognitive and motor inhibition and the working memory. So when I start, start talking about inhibition, it goes about controlling your impulses. And this is something that has been uh, researched for many years in the States, not only in the States, but uh, if uh, a child has problems with inhibition, inhibition, this means it cannot control his impulses. And then perhaps you already uh, heard talking about it, the marshmallow project. Well, this will have a tremendous influence on the development of a child. We know that children having problems with inhibition will have uh, a less, less good life later on, hmm? uh, to say it in a... a in a cautious way. And then also the working memory, because that's that's very important. Now, if you screen, you, you discover a number of problems, you work on it, well, these kids can also have the potential to go to the top. That's what I did in Belgium when I was responsible for one of the elite academies of the Belgian Federation. When my players came in, many of them had small problems. Everybody thought very poor players, and a few years later, uh, several of them became world stars. So screening. If you only worked with the so-called talents, you could not bring a team together. So I take, I take one of the quotes Johan Cruyff ever made. As a boy, I had no sense of my talent. I was always allowed to join an older group. Back then, there was no question of me being the best or feeling that way. I was the youngest and I had to fight every time to get in, to stay with it, to fit in. And that fight basically never stopped. What Johan is telling us, and I would like to work with someone who comes out of the Ajax uh, Academy, who is now one of the managers of the biggest sports project in the world in Saudi Arabia. Well, he told me, Kruijf many times, wanted to understand people, it goes about grit. It is more mentally than physically. Now, we go to something that has been checked uh, the last year. Uh, in Next to Ajax, you have AZ in, in Holland. Uh, and AZ University uh, does the follow-up of the AZ players. And they, they said, who is going to make the first team? If we look to what they found out, uh, here you can see it, 11% uh, of their youth players are early matured, 38 uh, normal and 61% late matured. And it are those players, the late mature players, uh, most of them go to the first team. So this is telling us, watch out, if you do not screen it correctly, if you do not look to it in the correct way, uh, you actually can complicate uh, a number of things. Now, uh, I took uh, also numbers uh, out of Belgium. If we check our, our under 14 selection today in elite football, we see that still 75% are early mature players and 15 only late and normal. This proves again that we are not looking to the problem in a correct way. But this is reality. So developing the intelligent player. What I do, every time I will explain something, I put it in what we call, uh, call a, a validity chart. So I take a number of parameters and I want to be sure that we keep this in mind. So in general, and this is proven by neuroscience, focus is the key word. 
if there is no focus, if mentally a player is not correctly organized, you can do whatever you want. It will not work. It is like Guardiola uh, told us, everything is controlled by the mind, by the brain. So focus is the key for access to learning. Now, in what I'm doing, there are four pillars. It goes first about attention, concentration, orientation that is connected with focus. This is the most important thing. If you do not work on this, all the rest will, will be very difficult. Then once they pick it up, they will show active engagement. And then you have to allow them to make uh, errors, ongoing errors, and they need immediate feedback. And then in the background, this is something uh, we, we have to respect, respect more and more, the consolidating of the knowledge. It's, it's, it's a pity, but when you're on the pitch, watch out. The real thing is not happening on the pitch. The real thing happens while young people, while people are sleeping. And also, you need to be aware of the fact that it goes about memorizing. So learning is an ongoing mix of cognition, emotion, mental and motor skills. To give you a simple idea, when someone is moving or is performing a skill, it doesn't only go about a biomechanical activity. There is also emotion and cognition in it. Now, what is covered in the session, because uh, I will show you a lot of videos, but what's covered in, in the demo training? Again, validity chart, the learning principles of the MBM methodology, and it's based on recognition prime decision making. What is so special about this? Well, if the brain already has some information about a particular activity, it will, it will be possible to recognize in a, in a very fast way uh, what to do. This means that uh, when you, you uh, offer your uh, players some drills, they always will compare what they are doing with information they already have in their, in their brain. This is the recognition. Watch out for experience and intuition. Neuroscience uh, does uh, make us understand that it's not so reliable. Intuition in certain circumstances, it can help us. And there is an explanation for it uh, because our brain doesn't like to consume a lot of energy and then we go to intuition. It's the same with experience, but it is a, it is, it's not the best way to, to set up training programs. So the moment the brain primes uh, the things it has recognized, then you go to a very high level of learning. And the parameters in learning are curiosity, grit, a growth mindset, focus, alertness, flow, conscious and aerobic movement orientation. And that's something I want, I want to, to emphasize we need to make it possible also in the school system to offer more aerobic movements during a school day. In between courses, small, small activities, four to eight minutes based on aerobic movement and the learning process will grow a lot. Why? Because when you start moving, uh, let's say uh, about 75 percentage of your maximum maximal uh, heart rate, you actually produce uh, BDNF, that's a brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and that is the, the feeder of the brain. And you will, you will actually have an influence on what we call GABA. This means this is, this is something that uh, blocks the plasticity of the brain. So those small uh, moving activities will, will make it possible that children learn better than visualizing, thinking, making mistakes and continuously correcting, fixed context with patterns, repetitions, variations and adjustments, retrieval structures. That is also something very important. We'll come back 
in the drills, watch out, uh, you're always connected with a context. So you cannot organize a drill without the contextual interference. Because the moment the child steps into a drill, the brain is looking for a connection with the environment. Chunking, this means significant grouping, memorizing, decision-making, executive functions. And then I've put it in red. These are two of the most important didactical pillars. Always start with explicit direct instruction, and then you go to self-regulation autom autonomous learning, what is actually also based on implicit learning. Positive feedback, success experience, synchronization, cooperation, dynamic thinking, testing yourself and coaching others, mental representations, and then I already said it, so important to consolidation through sleep, memory, interleaving spacing. And I'll explain what uh, I tried to, to tell you through interleaving and spacing. To give you an idea, uh, in the project in Switzerland today, uh, our 15, 16 years old, old boys, they now coach and train younger teams. They do it during training sessions and they also coach them in, in matches. Okay. Two important learning principles, interleaving spacing. Spacing means constant rehearsal or uh, repetition. First gives you the impression that the learned is hunting. By constantly rehearsing, you mainly use your short-term memory. Struggling to hold information and retrieve it later after distraction via uh, an intermediate command will cause the information to be transferred from short-term memory to long-term memory. Frustration, so keep this in mind, frustration is not a sign that you're not learning, whereas convenience is. The best learning path is slow and poor performance at first, and it's essential for better performance later on. So immediate good performance is not equal to a learning process. And this is, this is reality uh, not only in sports, but for all we are doing in our life. So make it difficult, make it difficult to memorize. Then interleaving, varied or mixed learning. This means practicing different skills interchangeably or constantly changing the execution of a, of a skill, changing the ball size, available space. Interleaving improves the ability to link the right skill or strategy to a problem or match situation. If you go on using uh, standards, uh, the quality of what uh, players will do will go down because our brain is always looking for challenges. So developing the intelligent player, now we have to put uh, in front of each other the cognitive covering uh, opposite to set children on their way to discover themselves, connections, inside structure, skills. And that's what I, I try to explain through AD means explicit direct instruction and autonomous learning. Now, in the past, we relied a lot on cognitive covering, and that causes weak performance in football. We, we thought uh, that we had to concentrate on very strong and early specializing. Uh, training defined skills. Avoid the continuous variability of a task. So repeating, repeating, repeating. Eh? Narrowing the focus of the brain. Hindering the development of uh, creativity. Falling to endless repetitions. Now, this is the old system today. NASA, if you can check it yourself, uh, Professor Land told us, through that system, the cognitive covering, we actually, we actually uh, decided to uh, go to conversions. We close the brain of, of children. It, they did research on it, and you will not believe me, when they checked uh, uh, what creativity young kids have, at the age of five, they found out that 98% of the children are all very creative. 
Then five years later, they checked again. Uh, there only remained 32 percentage. Again, five years later, 12. And at the age of 20, only 2% of the people still have the creative mind. This tells us that something is not right in our educational system. We always go to conversions. We have to go to diversions. And that's the reason they now tell us, please concentrate on abstract learning. Give them insights. Uh, let them make connections. As you can see, you can test this with the Raven test. And here you have an example. You only have to, to think in a logical way. You see uh, at the bottom how the black box shifts from one part to another. That's what children need to learn. And that will come back in, uh, in the training sessions as well. So the importance of autonomous learning. Uh, Professor Yo Boulder states in our book, Limitless Mind, children in cooperation, their progress was due to the fact that they took the time to explain the substance to others, which is one of the best opportunities for children, students to understand it even better themselves. So, it's, it's hard, but as a coach, we have to step back. And you will see it, uh, although it's not so simple to put it in, in a video with kids uh, only experience it for the first time. But the main goal is to make it possible that first you, you are going to, to coach them in an explicit way, and after some time, you step back and you give it to them because there is no more discussion. The result of what you are going to do in that way is many times bigger compared with what we did for so many years. Okay. So we put it next to each, uh, each other. First, so the explicit directive instruction, and then we go uh, to autonomous learning. I added a research because it actually uh, it actually tells the same. You go from explicit to implicit learning. And uh, as I'm involved in the organization of Chinese football, we had a research on it. Ying, uh, Yang and Ping Li, uh, they they wanted to to be sure that uh, we are telling the correct things, and the research confirmed it. So. The explicit direct instructions based on 1,500 studies and meta-analysis meta told us first learn a sequence of skills. Organizing and structuring problems requires a mature prefrontal cortex. That's the front part of your brain. And this is something we need to, to pick up because this prefrontal cortex is only fully grown at the age of 25 years old. So do not think young people immediately can decide for themselves. Uh, it takes a lot of time. And then guide children in this and give positive feedback. That's the first part in every training session. And then we go to autonomous learning. Let the player, players project the, the AD, the explicit direct instructions assignment in a constantly changing context. Support the search for solutions, encourage cooperation, give positive feedback, vary and adjust the execution if everything runs too smoothly. So now we go closer to, to the pitch reality. So the changing context uh, of autonomous learning, and we work constantly in changing areas. So here you can see the, the top uh, part is 80, the bottom part, autonomous learning. And you, you, you read in red, priming. So what we do, we put them in a cross that makes it possible that they shift continuously or reorientate continuously in the drill. And the fact they have to rethink every time what they are doing uh, is having a tremendous influence. So we start 80, uh, moving from right to left, and in the second part, when we go to autonomous learning, we tell them, now it's up to you. Now you have to do the same things, but from left to right. What is the explanation in the end? And watch out for this, because this is recent uh, scientific uh, research. 
influencing a player's attention through coherent line structures, patterns. This is something we didn't know. We see closed contours better and faster than open contours. That's, for instance, the importance of grids. So if you set up your drill in a, in a part of the pitch and there is no closed contours, the learning will be poor because uh, we didn't know that. Your brain is not only looking to the drill, is also learning, uh, learn, uh, looking to the context. It is actually the same in a Zoom meeting when my, my head would be visible uh, without interruption. You actually uh, create a lot of problems for the brain because the brain will not only look to me, but without being aware, your brains will always, also look to the background, to uh, the room, the, the objects that are, are, uh, are available in, in the room. So this is something you need to understand. The, you only look with your brain, not with your eyes. Lines that are in line with each other are considered belonging and part of something larger, with, which uh, leads to a higher attracting attention while performing. In other words, the activation of their representations in the brain is slightly stronger than the activation of the representations of loose lines. We didn't know that. But here you see, simply through my organization, I already have an influence on the attention, the focus. We also have to take into account the fact that during ball games, our gaze will not be on the ball itself, but on the place where the ball will be in a split second. Anticipating on what will happen is unique for the functioning of the brain and aims at helping preparing actions. After all, an activity is smoother when, your, when our attention is more focused on preparing the next part than on evaluating what we do or have already done. That explains why Xavi Hernandez, why Malcolm Douglas, why uh, Andrea Pirlo uh, are so skilled, because they make use of, of this principle. Second part, now we go to the practice. For all children, all ages, you use your brain throughout all the training session. You cannot, you cannot uh, start thinking. First, I concentrate a, a bit on uh, brain-centered learning, and then I go to my traditional uh, training session. No, the brain is there every second of the training session. So my focus or my main goal is make players act faster and think faster. So I'll... I'll give you an idea how we uh, respect all the things I've already explained. You already saw the cross. In the cross, there's a diamond, there are four squares and the gridding. And you know, the context is important. So we start, start with the cross. In the cross, we already have the diamond. Then we can go to four squares. And finally, according to the age of players, we use grids, nine grids, 15, 20 or 25. So empower the recognition. This is the organization that makes it possible that the brain will use the context to uh, empower uh, the recognition of what children are doing. So according to the age, you can see nine grids for the age six till nine and 15 grids for uh, the age 10 till 13. And we also today uh, are aware of the fact that the, the mission of the goalkeeper is different. He can no, no longer stay in his goal. He uh, has to be part of the game. So he's not only a goalkeeper, he's also an additional uh, field player. Here you can see the grid zones for the goalkeeper. Now, when I explain something about the cross, now look, we keep the same context and we will have a very fast visual reorganization. So from the drills to games, it's only a small step. I take away three cones. That me means the, the one in the middle. Then I replace two cones by two goals. And I use the four squares for the youngest kids. Later on, we, uh, we will adapt to the age. 
And actually, the same structure is is available to to uh, play some games or to have some scrimmage. Hmm? Okay, training session, ball mastery, uh, validity chart. What are the parameters of uh, the drill I'm going to show? Uh, they have to to prove they can work in a synchronous way. So synchronous use of time and space. I concentrate on attention and concentration. Conscious, conscious movement in space, high reactivity, fast rotational movements, rapid uh, directional changes. They have to maintain speed after change of direction because many times we, we see that when they go into the second part of, of a movement, they slow down. But slowing down means concentration goes down, focus goes down, and that's dangerous. Action posture in the start, our didactical principles, AD and autonomous learning, correct decision making, split vision, and always reposition immediately because that's the key. Try to be ahead, try to anticipate uh, going to happen. So, in this drill, I asked my assistant, he is my youngest son, when he raises one arm, uh, the players have to make a turn of 180 degrees away from an imagined player. When he raises two arms sideways, they have to change uh, direction vertically. That means when they start running in the cross at the right side and he raises two arms, they have to go to the left side. And this will influence their performance in the center of the cross. If he makes other movements, uh, there is no action. Then they have to go on running and they have to make the turn in the middle of, of the drill. So, but they have to be aware that there is an, uh, there is an opponent, imaged opponent. If they are running at the right uh, of the cross, at their left, there is an opponent and they can never turn to the opponent. They have to turn away from the opponent. To give you an idea. So the focus is on the coach in the middle, not on the running. And they have to endure the coach's arm movements that are not connected with the requested movements. This is cognitive readiness. This is what I need to know before I will ask them to do other things. Mentally, they have to be ready for, for the job. And at the end, we speed up. The drills are performed by young players uh, belonging to the best academy in Belgium today, uh, Genk, Racing Genk. Uh, and I, I assure you, uh, they, they are making a big impression all over Europe because many, many of the top clubs come to, to gang to, to assist the training sessions. So what mistake did one of the players make? Look, he was at the left of the, the act in the cross. And when he turned, he turned over his right shoulder. So he turned towards the imaginary opponent. This is something we need to explain to him. Watch out. You have to, to preserve the advantage of time and space. Next part, second drill, body mastery. Synchronous uh, working because synchronization, the fact they always have to check they arrive at the same time in the center of the drill uh, influences Cognition and cognition means concentration, alertness, uh, the working memory is trained. This has got a tremendous influence on all the learning processes. Then external focus, always screen the environment, conscious movement in space, use your fourth cross coordination, jump upwards on two feet, moving laterally, fast situational ad adaptability, memorizing, Constant thinking and no single focus 
in attentional blindness. Watch out, when you put your focus on one thing, you do not see the other things. I think many, many people already saw uh, the video with the gorilla uh, walking through uh, a number of pe people uh, playing basketball, throwing balls to each other. Well, if we ask you to focus on, on one thing, you will not see other things. This is something we, we, we have to be aware of. Then the orientation capacity and visualizing. Red, forward, backward. Blue, sideways. Yellow, jump. And white is actually green. Here you have to think differently. Imagine the white as green. And green is the cross jump. So every colored uh, little disc is connected with the movement. Um, let's see. This is lateral movement. This one is. Sorry. This one is jumping. The red one is forward backwards. And then white and the coach in the center goes with his foot to the white cone they have to connect it to green and this means they start jumping or they have to jump in a crosswise uh, way okay now let's see what's happened so the trainer in the middle indicates the color with his feet so again not internalizing, not focus on yourself. You have to pick up the information in the deep. And you have to remember white is green. So they never know what's going to happen. And that's very important because football is unpredictable. So they do not know what skill or movement they have to make before they pick up the information through the coach in the center. And now you see the cross jump. We, we check something and I will explain you why we do this. It is, it is connected with screening. Okay. Now, testing themselves. Now they have to apply independently. This means I've, I've made the colors a little bit more visual. Now they have to uh, apply the correct movement according to the color. So, but the colored hats are in a different order for each player. So they cannot imitate what others are doing. They are testing themselves and actually, they are testing their memory. And this is very important because testing yourself is learning. The skills that are thought must be stored in the long-term memory. Usually, a skill is only stored in the short-time memory via many repetitions. And then the focus goes down because Repetition, repetition means for the, for the brain, uh, I start to, to know it, I start to understand it, so uh, the focus goes down. If players have to make an effort to remember a movement, the learning process is greatly strengthened and starts storing everything better in memory. So forgetting and remembering are an excellent weapon to strengthen learning. Now, here we only use four skills, four movements. But when I'm working in, uh, in an elite environment, also in, in grassroots, it depends, it depends how players are developing. I go to six, eight, 10, 12 different drills or 10, uh, 12 different movements. And uh, you, you can understand uh, it, makes, it makes it a lot more difficult and uh, it's much more complex to keep control over it. Now, you will not believe me, but 
we can we can really influence memory in a tremendous way. Uh, and as I already said, uh, memorizing is expertise. Now, what mistakes did the player make? We go to the first one. I'll help you. Simultaneous jumping with two feet. The, the fact that lateral moving, moving is not performed uh, foot by foot means that he is not well organized in his brain and in his body. So the lateralization is not there. Second one. When we look to this boy, when he stops, you will see that his left arm and left foot are forwards together. Right arm and right uh, leg or foot are backwards together. This means again, no developed lateralization in the brain. As long as that's uh, happening in the brain, as long as that is present in the brain, they will have problems to, to learn. So we have to change all that. Uh, we know through research in neuroscience that it will take about six weeks and it's gone. But it, it, it has got a tremendous influence on learning. Next drill, now we go to, go to ball mastering. The parameters are, again, synchronous uh, performance, body always between the ball and opponent, lots of ball contacts outside uh, foot, turning with ball outside foot, turning with inside foot, step over, uh, the ball behind supporting foot, directional changes, use balls in different sizes, constant thinking, orientation capacity, and memorizing. So we give them four skills and we put a name on it. So the first one is Belgium. Turning with the inside foot is connected with Belgium. The second one, Germany, is turning with the outside foot. The third one, France, sorry. The third one, France, a step over with the right foot, but always keep your body between the ball and the opponent. And then number four is Italy. Now, what's going to happen? Uh, I'm going to determine through the, the names of the country what skill they have to, to apply. And if I want to make it a little bit more difficult, I will replace the name names of the, of the countries by the names of the capitals. So, we go on. so it's the coach who shouts the names of the countries or the capitals. Again, they do not know what to do before they get the name. And if the coach shouts the name of a country that is not in the drill, and that's what I'm explaining. Well, if the name is not the name of the country or capital is not in the drill. They dribble through the center cone and change balls. So football is unpredictable. Here we only do it with four drills. Again, we can extend it to six, eight or 10. We are actually training the mental capacity and also the cognitive capacity of our players. So what's, what's so special about this? Players cannot go out of the session because as you can see, they have to reposition to be in the correct, in the correct position, starting position. And Oh, 
Okay. So we call this embodied cognition. Moving strengthens thinking and thinking strengthens moving. A thought is part of a thought process or an action process. A thought can be deliberately used to provoke an action linked to concentration. So we now know through neuroscience that thinking and moving goes together. Next drill, uh, again, synchronous moving, body always between ball opponent, lots of ball contacts outside, foot, quick change of feet, pass, foot will become the run foot, Correct timing, present yourself while moving to receive a pass, orient, oriented or orientated passing, quick position change, constant thinking, orientation capacity, and visualizing. So I'll give you an idea. They start running, they pass the center cone, they turn, and now it's a give and go. This means that after the turn, the player in front of them will start dribbling, will put pressure on them, and then they have to be uh, supported by a second player who presents himself in the center of the square to make it possible that there can be a give and go. I'll repeat it again to give you an idea of what's happening. So dribbling with the right foot, turn, then and that's important. They change from the right foot to the left one because when they play the ball with the left foot, they can immediately use their passing foot as a running foot. Otherwise, it will take more time to uh, accelerate. And whistle. He's over Come on. Hop, hop, hop. Dribble, 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 dribble. Hop. Hop. Last one. Tick. Dribble. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Hop. Hop. So this is the AD phase. So they start with, uh, with the ball from the right side uh, of the outside cone. And you can see it uh, many times, uh, the, the player at the outside several times is already too much in the drill. This means they are struggling with it because it's not so easy to, to, to pick up the rhythm of the performance, but this is what we want. We want them to, to have problems, to struggle with, with the drill. Now, autonomous learning. Now we are not going to explain a lot. Hold on a second. The player who has the ball is going to stand on the left side and the supporting player on the right. We are going to see if you can mix this. Now we are going to have to think differently in space. A few remarks. Remember, when you play the ball, we are now leaving from the left. You're going to turn beyond the middle cone again, and then you're going to play the ball to your supporting player. Next, you're going to play the pass with your right foot. Why? If you were to use your left foot, you're going to need three times to give the pass and to let follow your running action. If you play with the right foot, your pass foot immediately becomes your running foot and you only need two times. If you use three times, you give an opponent more time to put pressure on you. Also remember, you have to accelerate when you pass the upcoming player and you are not going to follow the ball. The supporting player presents himself in motion in the middle of the square and plays the ball while turning open, oriented pass. 
let's try it. Be aware of the fact this is now from a different perception. Normally, I don't explain all that. It's simply because this is a demonstration and actually those players, they already know what it means autonomous learning. But now you can see uh, how they uh, try to adapt to the drill because uh, what I already told you, starting from the right means after the turn, changing from right to left foot. Now they start from the left uh, side of the outside cone. So in the center, they will, will go from their left to their right foot. This is something we don't explain them continuously. They have to experience it themselves. It is implicit learning. And I, I want to, to repeat it again. Normally, in the autonomous part, I will not explain uh, anything because we, we always use about 15 minutes for each drill. This means six minutes, explicit direct instruction. Then we give them a few minutes rest most of the time three minutes and we already tell them okay watch out now you are going to do the same drill but from left to right start thinking so then they go into the second part uh, six minutes and this covers 15 minutes here you can see it uh, we also filmed it with a drone and they make mistakes look they they do not know anymore because the fact they have to reorientate reorient, in space uh, makes it uh, complicated. But this is what we want. They make errors and they correct them. And I'll give them immediate feedback. So the MBM framework through which technical skills, positional awareness, interplay in time and space are clearly combined. And then to go to what is called differential learning, we uh, use a smaller, a smaller ball size. So every time, and this is only a demonstration because we do much more things in this training sessions, but it, it's to give you an idea how we can make grow the complexity. So this is to, to tell them, watch out. Uh, and it is also uh, influenced by the distances we use. If, they, if we see, they can do it. You saw one of the players was leaving too late. They can do it uh, in, a, in a fluent way we will change the organization, we will uh, reduce space, uh, we will reduce the distance, and that makes it more complicated because the pressure of time and space is growing. Another one, so training the intelligent player, act faster and think faster. Slowly thinking is slowly moving. The Florida effect. And now you can see here we concentrate on the center and we want to see if synchronization is there. And uh, there are some small differences, but uh, they correct more and more. You see, if one of the players is too late, it will have an influence on the performance of the drill. The second exercise, now, in, as I already said, in a smaller space, less time, faster thinking, and above all, thinking in advance, smaller ball sizes. So here, there will be more errors. We have to correct, reorganize, and encourage. Here you can see it takes a little bit of time because less space means faster thinking. And this is what I already uh, referred to, contextual interference. It's more effective to make a lot of variation during practice. Actually, we try to vary continuously the contents of our drills so that the player always has to deal with new situations and have to plan and execute 
every move again. How much variation is optimal? Well, that depends uh, on the level of your players. And does the optimal variation depend on the skill level of the athlete? Yes. We see shorter distances and smaller balls. Okay, then because neuroscience tells us association is very important. So the same structure we are now going to ex expand. Uh, that, that means we, uh, we add goals and finishing. I repeat it. But this is something we do in, in the next training session. So they have to memorize because when they arrive back, uh, in a uh, second training session, I put uh, I, I put the cones, and actually I already I think you already understand the context is is the same, but I will also perform or repeat what we have learned the last time, and then I add goals and finishing. It's up to them to think together with us, and that's very important. I'll repeat it again, so we only show one player. He turns, give and go, diagonal dribbling, oriented control, and then finishing. Although with an animation, it's not so easy to show it in, in a realistic way. Structured games. This is the last part. Again, the parameters, synchronous working movement. Accurate and powerful fitting, oriented control, quick directional changes with the ball, make the defender move, quick decisions, slow down and accelerate to break free from the opponent. Scoring with inside foot, defender is only allowed to intercept the shot, stays about two meters or three yards uh, away. Uh, goalkeeper must communicate with defender, creative dribbling, scoring. We'll give you an idea through an animation. First, the, the player at the top, and then the one at the bottom to give you an idea. So the, the defenders are only shielding the pathway to the goal. The attacker tries to score. But, and this is to prove you, now the coach calls again the names of the learned skills. So he will use Belgium, Germany, France, Italy, or uh, Brussels, Berlin, Paris, and Rome, which means that the player must constantly think, make decisions linked to time and space, deal with the pressing opponent. And he can only score after the trainer called go. So, here you can see it, free yourself from the opponent by continuous direction changes. And the fact they can only use skills connected to the names makes it possible for the coach to, to check if they are ment mentally uh, still uh, there, so concentrated having the right focus, and you'll see how they show very high skillfulness. Okay. So now we add two principles that will affect the neuroplasticity of the brain. We enrich the work, the work zone. That is the zone with obstacles from which to score and to oblige the attacking player to appeal to direct directional changes and to use his technical skills with an even bigger focus. We are going to lend a hand to the effort-based reward principle by giving the attacker a very short opportunity to score the reward. For this, the defender and the goalkeeper must stand on one foot when the coach shouts freeze. Two counts, this means when I shout one, two, they stand on one foot. And then during that period, the attacker has to decide 
very quickly to score after changing direction. He cannot immediately, he cannot score uh, in the freeze moment, no. Uh, in the freeze moment, he has to change direction. He gets the pressure again, and then he has to score. And the scoring means he gets a reward. And that's very important for the brain. It's very important to be rewarded. We can test memorizing again. The attacker must apply the learned techniques when the coach calls Belgium, Germany, France, Italy, or Brussels, Berlin, Paris, or Rome. And we can also have an influence on the defender when, if, uh, for instance, when I, I use the colors again, red, blue, yellow, green is not used. They have to go back to the movements they have learned earlier in the training session. To give you an idea, you see in the second zone, it's not only uh, using the technical drills, but also avoiding the cones. This makes it more complex. And that's actually to give you an idea about MBM or neuroscience in football. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Michel, thank you. Uh, that was a lot to unpackage for sure. Yeah. Uh, and again, my head is spinning, you know, I talked to you beforehand that, uh, that even before this, my head was spinning, it's still spinning. And I know, uh, there's a few people texting me saying like, holy smokes, like this is, <laughs> this is next level, if you will. Um, so I had a couple of questions that kind of came, uh, came to my mind. Uh, and if anyone else has questions, please unmute, put them in the chat. If you, if you don't want to unmute, no problem. But, uh, one of the key things that kind of came to my mind is, is how often are you running sessions like that? Like, uh, with those gang boys, um, and how many times a week are they actually training? They actually, uh, they actually do it every training session because it's all organized in the same way, but this is only a demonstration because uh, you have to to make use of all the the goals you have in your your training program. Now, for them, those boys they they have normally four training sessions weekly, but we also do it in a grassroots environment and in schools. Yes. So it's not it's not important. Uh, the frequency is not so. Uh, so important it is a matter of entering the brain because what we see uh, if i would demonstrate it with grassroots players speed goes down it will it will be a lot slower but for me that's not important after four or five weeks you will not believe what's happening because they pick it up and what we want what we want to know is what will be the impact what will be the influence on their school performance because it's quite logical if you if you train the brain if you go to the cognitive and mental uh, activities in the brain this is what you need uh, in whatever situation in your life so but it is it is always organized uh, around what we call brain-centered learning. There is no, no training session that, uh, because I can understand uh, in this demonstration, you could not immediately see a more free scrimmage or, or game, but this is also in it. Uh, but it, it takes a lot of time to explain you step by step how we, we use all the principles and uh, transfer it from a 1v1 to a 1v2, uh, 2v3, then we go 4v4, 5v5. Actually, after some time, and that's what, what I already explained, when we start doing this with the youngest kids, and uh, they are in it for several years, to give an idea uh, what we are doing right now in Genk and in Lugano, the boys who started to do this at the age of nine, 10 years old, today they are 15, 16, 
they organize together with with the coach the training sessions of uh, of younger kids not continuously but uh, during the season we will invite them several times to to coach their younger younger uh, teammates and what's so important about about it when they have to to teach it themselves the knowledge about what they have to to master when they want to play soccer will, will, will be empowered. And it's nice to see they are also coaching games, how they do it in a different way. They do not shout anymore. They do not know if there is a, we actually many times with younger kids, we play uh, tournaments to give an idea, uh, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. So we invite six uh, teams. And the only thing that matters is play 20 minutes, feedback, play again 20 minutes. Losing or winning is for us not important. They can win a, t- a game, but then they go into the next one. There they can lose. What we do is every time we ask questions, we tell them, okay, this was good. Why did we win the game? What was, uh, what was uh, the power of what, what we have been doing? But when we lose, we ask them, why did it go wrong? We are not interesting interested at the end of uh, such a small tournament to tell the parents and, uh, and the world, oh, we have won the tournament. That's not important. The only, the only thing that matters is knowledge of learning. So if they have played five or six times, 20 minutes, and we, we do not always do it because then I speak about 5v5. So we have also st- substitutes. So we actually uh, spread uh, the physical load uh, in a good way but at the end the only thing that matters is that we uh, end the the tournament and we we try to go to conclusions tell them okay we did some good things and some bad things what do we have to keep in mind what was good what uh, do we still have to work on we are not interested in ranking a child needs time to develop and after some time it's nice when you when you ask a 16 15 16 year year old player to follow up to to organize all that i think you can imagine it's it's a pity we can actually that's something i think i will do i will give you the opportunity to listen to those, those boys when they are explaining the whole program and after a few years, you don't have to go to, to written, written goals. Eh? They will tell you how it works. And that's the power. If the knowledge is permanently in the brain, yeah, then, and this is something you can do with all the players. And that explains why uh, the interest of the schools is growing. Because this is, this is a system that can have a tremendous influence on learning processes in the classroom. And, and really, we're teachers on the field, right? So the educational component is, is still there within what we do. Um, yeah, if, you, if you go to my website and you, you, because we are reorganizing, because we have so much to do, uh, the reason is I'm also involved in development of new technology. In the near future, uh, we will use artificial intelligence. Uh, I, will, I will send you some information. You will not believe what, what we are going to do. Uh, we, developed, we developed shoes with sensors in it. Actually, uh, the drills you saw, they will, they will be captured with the new technology. I don't have to, to uh, concentrate anymore on the performance. The moment my drill stops, I have all the results on my iPad. I can see how players are using their feet. All, all problems they have in moving, uh, the supporting phase or the acceleration or the parts of the foot they use while kicking, it, it, will, it will go through the artificial uh, intelligence 400 uh, uh, data check and at the end of the training session i have a full image of uh, of the performance of my players 
And this will be available in a way that everybody can afford it. We have been working on it for more than five years, but it is unbelievable what you're going to see. And then in the next step, we are now designing uh, a resource you can put in your ears and on the back of your head. And that will tell us what's happening in the brain. I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, I was involved in testing Neymar, Oscar, but we had bad luck because at that moment it was before the 2014 World Championship in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, Neymar got injured. Uh, he broke one of his toes, I think. So we couldn't, we couldn't put him in the field test because the field test was also uh, based on neuroscience. Uh, he had to wear, uh, to wear a shirt with sensors and we actually already knew what was going to happen. But uh, what, uh, what did we have to do? Uh, because it was a Japanese uh, broadcasting company. They already did it with uh, Mark Phelps, with Usain Bolt. They wanted to have an idea of uh, top performance in football. So the fact we could not uh, organize uh, the test, uh, we have put them in a scanner. And we asked Neymar, move your feet. Stretch out, turn your feet left, right. And then we can see in the brain through the blood, uh, blood uh, that comes into particular zones in, uh, in, in the brain, what he is doing. Well, the scan we got from Neymar, when he was moving his feet left and right, there was almost no activity in the brain. We also did it with other professional players and with amateur players. Well, it's unbelievable. The other professional players already a lot more activity. The grassroots or amateur players, a lot uh, activity all over the brain. What is actually the contradiction? When we see a lot of activity at the outside, skillfulness means in, in the brain, few activity. A lot of people still think if you want to perform mentally or cognitively at a high level, there's a lot of activity. Oh no, if you go to a very high level, there is few activity. And this is what we need to know because we, we, we now understand that innate talent is a misunderstanding. We all arrive with a very big potential in this world, but brain can make it very uh, difficult to, to use this potential. And most of all, because through the working memory, when stress uh, arises in the working memory or in the prefrontal cortex, actually a child cannot use his full potential. And this is what we need to know. We are not, we are not only concentrating on uh, helping the best players. We want, we want to make it possible that every child can get out of his potential what is in it. So this also, now we are close to the final solution. We already did it in skiing, but it will be, it, it will be very, very comfortable. You only need to put two things in your ear, ears and something at the back of your, your uh, brain. And I can tell you before you step into a training session, oh, wait a moment, he is stressed or there's not enough energy in his body. So this is permanent screening. And it will be affordable because that one, that's if I will only accept to be part of a project if they do it for all the children, not for the rich ones. No, every child has to uh, have the opportunity to make use of this. I love that. The, yeah, that, that I, I don't like, I don't like to uh, divide the world in parts. Uh, I also work with uh, children having learning problems. Uh, that's, that's very important to, to help them. Working with big stars is a, is a nice experience, but uh, that is a little bit too easy uh, to start talking about uh, development. Okay. I know, uh, I know James had his hand up as well for a question. So Michelle, if we could still, I don't know, 
10, no. 15 more of your minutes. I know no that the problem. sun's up. I can see it in your background right. there. So, uh, <laughs> James, if you'd like to, to unmute and yeah. ask away. Uh, thank you for the session. It's really, um, really inspiring and enlightening. And there's a lot of stuff that I learned here. Um, just a quick, quick question about like the kids, when you give them those actions or the, the different, like, like the cities, Belgium and Paris and all that stuff, do you do, um, do you prep them ahead of time? Do you give them like questions say, hey, these are the things that you're, we are going to say red is this, green is this. Do you, some type of, or, or do you teach them right on the spot? We teach on the spot. They, they, they do not get it in uh, before the training session. We do it on the spot. But it is, it is, it's quite logical that when you start thinking of your own kids, you need to understand what can I expect from them. If, if it's too difficult to do it with four colors, we start with two colors. The, the key is actually to, to uh, match with your uh, training reality. But uh, what is important, if it's too difficult for them, using four colors, I start with two. And after a few minutes, I go to three colors. And I want to see how they react on it. Uh, that is enormously important because it has to be tailor-made. Otherwise, it gives, it's, uh, you know what, what the problem is? And that's the reason why I, I do, do not like so much to, to show everything with the lead player because that simplifies a little bit the problem. But if I want to show you uh, the dynamic part of it, you, you will understand I have to, to do it with, with uh, let's say, a little bit more developed uh, players. I do not want to use the word skilled because skilled means I have to give you time to learn. And that's, that's what I do... Uh, constantly and spontaneously, I always try to understand what is the starting position? What is the uh, situation in the start? How are we going to, to, to make the players understand all that? And I will never, I will never tell them immediately five, six or eight colors. Oh, no. Uh, they have to. That's the reason why, uh, why neurology, cognitive neurology and neuropsychology tells us they have to have the feeling I can do it. So it goes about self-esteem, self-confidence. All those things are continuously in the background. And once they, they show you they can do it, the grit and the focus will grow. And that's, that are keys. The word focus is is enormously important okay thank you welcome thanks james for that uh martin your hand was up next and then steven and then david <laughs> no problem i still have time so i <laughs> <laughs> well first of all thank you for uh for amazing opportunity to listen to your presentation uh, it was very thought-provoking but I i'm more like seeking if you don't mind your opinion from the theory point of view Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you mentioned the decision making, you know, last several years, I was trying to understand, you know, more and more about that and how to develop it in the players alongside the problem solving. And when I look at the research point of view, there is usually like three approaches which are respected. The first one is more about the, the naturalistic approach, which is about, you know, the, the typicality of the situation, if you will. Then there's the information processing you've mentioned, which is more about the, the perception than decision making and action mm -hmm. process with those mental representations, if you want to call it that way. Yeah, yeah. And then there is the ecological dynamic uh, approach, which is speaking more about <clears throat> the, the perception action, the ongoing relationship between the player and the environment, which you also mentioned. Usually mm -hmm. the explanation of the difference between them is the function of the memory in them. Mm -hmm. So my yeah. opinion is, uh, what is your opinion, especially on the last one, the ecological dynamic approach, if, if, you, if you don't mind to, to maybe collaborate a little bit on that? Because like my big question, which you know, I would like you, if you can help me answer, is with the information processing, uh, I am sometimes not able to really explain to myself, probably a lack of the education, 
that how to explain when the player doesn't have the time to actually think about the decision he made for the action. And you mentioned a little bit with the Neymar case when his brain didn't line up. So, you know, he didn't probably have to think about what he what he's doing that much. Mm. Information processing for me is more talking about, you know, that opportunity to actually retrieve the information from the long term memory working and then use it. So would you mind to maybe just tell me your opinion on this, please? Yeah, look, uh, one of the one of the most important things in all that is visualizing, because uh, it's quite logical if you if you want them to make use of decision making, yeah, you have to to go to to the brain. And I already I already mentioned it. Uh, recognized, uh, we call it uh, recognized prime decision making is the key, but. Uh, what we what we uh, want to know in a better way, uh, you get you get your information out of the context of the game. So you have to read continuously, to screen continuously uh, the game. But the problem is to give you an idea. Uh, I will send the document to to Jordan. Uh, we had a study on the game of Barcelona. The game of Barcelona is full of geometry. It's nothing else. And how do they train it? Actually, they repeated what I, what I do as well. We actually visualize all our, our actions and, and we put our skills in, in a very clear geometrical organization. Why? Because uh, what plays a part in it uh, you can you can uh, look to it from an ecological uh, way, but one of the things we begin to understand is that when the unconscious mind uh, falls together with the conscious mind, then you go to uh, very fast decision making, because this is the power. Watch out! As long as the unconscious mind overrules the conscious mind, it will go wrong. But then the question was, okay, how can we make it possible that the conscious and unconscious mind will come together? Then there is only one, one solution, and that, that's contextual interference. Then you need, and that's what uh, scientists told us uh, the last few years, you need to understand that the way people are using their brain to pick up information out of the out of the context out of the environment that has to be organized because the brain is a pattern machine every second you are living the brain is looking for patterns so that is the this is actually the word in between unconscious and conscious uh, mind and that's also the reason i think uh, and you refer to it that mental representations can help you a lot but those mental representations have to be connected uh, with conscious experiences you already had in, in the game. That's the reason, and you are fully right, many of the big stars, and this is what we are doing uh, today as well uh, in the elite environment, but this is not so easy when you're working in a grassroots environment. We actually, we actually ask players to play already the game before it will take place. And I can give you a fantastic example. Uh, jo uh, Michael Jordan, when he was winning the first NBA title, uh, the evening before the game, he already, through mental representations, played the game. There, the, I, have, I have the research on it and I have the, the feedback on it. And what was so special about it? Because he was thinking uh, he was thinking about the game in a way, what will the opponent expect me to do? So the moment he played the game, he did a number of things nobody expected. This has been filmed. There has been analysis on it. And it actually explains that uh, he, used, he used mental representations to, 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 be, to anticipate on the game he was going to, to play. And what was so special about it, he did a number of things in the game nobody ever saw in a basketball game. But 
the the key of of the whole problem is and that's what uh, scientists uh, tell us continuously now if everybody would see the world in the same way we would have less problems because it's our brain that makes up uh, a virtual uh, reality of the outside world and the problem is uh, that there are too many differences uh, between what I'm doing uh, through my brain regarding uh, the environment and what you are doing. But we now, we now understand, and there are, because I can, I can give you many other examples. We, when we start talking about neuroscience and how we can influence uh, learning processes, uh, things like, I already mentioned it, differential learning, four plus learning, uh, analog learning. Actually, we begin to understand that it is absolutely necessary, and I'll give you an example, to make it possible that young players will experience many things, not only one, uh, one sport. Huh? To, to give an example, uh, Federer, the tennis player, Till the age of 15, and it's in, uh, you can read it in, in the new book of David Epstein. It goes about being a generalist. Uh, Federer is actually a generalist. A lot of people think early, uh, early engagement, uh, you already started at a very young age playing uh, a lot of tennis. This is not correct. Till the age of 15, he was, he was uh, active in different sports, basketball, he, whatever you can think of, volleyball, soccer. And it's even, even weird that when he was 15, his mother was a, a tennis coach. She didn't want to assist these training sessions because she, she said he is, he is not skilled enough to play tennis. She was a little bit embarrassed when she assisted the training sessions, but... At 15, he decided to go for uh, tennis. And now we know that all the experiences through all the other sports influenced his balance, stability. He is less injured. And to be honest, uh, I also work with uh, people belonging to the Croatian uh, for, uh, Football Federation. Uh, one of the last uh, reports on injuries, it is... If what we are doing in soccer, we absolutely have to change all that because it is related uh, with the fact that we concentrate too much on football. But if you're interested, we, uh, I, uh, we are now using uh, a system that combines basketball and football. I can send you some information. It's exciting to see. And every time, and it's, it's the same eh, because in those two uh, sports, there are uh, geometrical resemblances. Uh, if you want to, to influence the speed of performance, the structure of basketball can help you uh, in football, when, in soccer, when you have to organize small-sided uh, games, it, it goes together. But the key, the key is yeah, unconscious and conscious experiences. Try to bring them together. And the moment they match better, all the rest uh, will have uh, less influence. But there is, no, there is no other way. You have to understand that the contextual interference, the environment uh, plays an in enormous big part in it. And then it's up to us to organize this environment. That's the reason why I decided to to use fixed, uh, a fixed organization. Uh, so according to the age, uh, every pitch has to guarantee that the, the children, the players can connect to, to the space that uh, is actually uh, the space according to their age. Because this is what we do continuously. Uh, but there are other things in the background because it's not easy to explain all that in a few minutes, but uh, the, the problem we had for many years is we repeated too much the same things and we, we thought that linear dynamics 
uh, would be the best the best way to develop. Now we know. Uh, I don't know if you ever uh, heard talking about life kinetics, nonlinear dynamics. They open the brain again. So if I would simply ask you to do a number of movements that are not conventional, so to give you an idea, to raise your arm forwards and another one upwards, and I, I make you do a number of movements you will never use in your life, at that moment, you open your brain again. Because your brain is enormously sensible for uh, movements. That explains, for instance, then that when a baby does not have a crawling face. So a lot of a lot of parents, young parents, they think, oh, let's encourage the baby to stand up. This is a big misunderstanding. Uh, the misunderstanding is the baby needs to crawl around. Uh, so to use cross movements uh, with hands and feet and then it organizes his brain if this doesn't happen the danger is there that when it's uh, going to be seven eight years old it will have learning problems at school and these are the things we we didn't know uh, so moving has got a tremendous influence on, on on learning but it is it's not in neuroscience to be honest, the brain is more complicated than space. Uh, I've talked about artificial intelligence, but artificial intelligence does not even come close to, to the brain. The brain is, is, is something it will still take a lot of time to understand it in a better way. I hope I, I, I gave you a, a little bit no, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for the for the answer. I can see a lot of lot of similarities between the information processing approach and the ecological dynamics, like yeah. self organization. You touched on, you know, yeah, way of discovering and exploration, uh, and the nonlinearity is is there as well. So I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And yeah, hopefully I'm going to be able to get some of those researches from you through uh, through Jordan. Okay. I'll be definitely up for him. One last thing. Watch out I will for the tail. Forward it the chaos theory because uh, i know they use it more and more but you cannot use it immediately with younger kids because kids need first to put information in their brain and then then i agree that the chaos theory can can help you that that's what nagelsmann the coach of of uh, Bayern munich is doing but you cannot do it from the start and this goes in against what we know today about babies. But that's something an advisor can give you if you, if you invest some time to study uh, how babies are already prepared to, to be part of life, you will be blow, blown away. I assure you, you will not believe what you're going to read. Okay. Michelle, uh, do you have time for two more questions? One from Stephen, no one from David. Is that fine? Awesome. Stephen, we'll start with you. Yeah, um, Michelle, so thank, thank you again um, for your time. Um, it's, it's a question maybe more along the research or the, the, uh, the research side of the technology side of it. You've talked a little bit about uh, neuroplasticity in, in the brain as, as part of the learning process. And there seems to be some interest these days on uh, transcranial direct stimulation of the mm -hmm. motor control yeah. center to try to enhance the learning process. Have, have you experimented anything with that uh and can that can that help amp this up or is is that uh a red herring no look it it is it is something uh, that will will influence the future but the problem is and that's that's many times uh, the same problem it's the transfer to a particular environment so if you, if you stimulate the brain, it, it is correct that a number of uh, functions will grow. But this doesn't mean it will happen uh, if you are in a soccer environment. Uh, it is actually, uh, it, it is the same some years ago. Luminosity was an American company. They, they told the world, if you make use of our brain drills on a computer, we will improve your brain. Uh, it's not that what they were telling was not uh, worthful, 
but there was no transfer, so you can improve your memory in the brain games, but this doesn't mean that you improve your memory in a, in a soccer context. This is the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that uh, what we can do with the brain has to be connected with the context. And that, that's what they are struggling with. The transfer uh, from one thing to another, they do not know today uh, how it works. And there's another thing in the background, the scanning, watch out for it because it's quite logical that science, uh, and I have to be critical in a correct way, they want to give us the, the impression it works perfectly. This is not correct. Even scans are not fully correct because there is more. So this is a critical analysis. If they ask a number of uh, scientists to make an interpretation of scans, many times the, there are different, different conclusions. And also because the scanning is not fully correct. But uh, I, I believe that in, in the coming years, uh, everything will be improved and uh, will we'll guarantee that there will be less, less errors in, in what we are uh, measuring. But it is, it is, it is important. Uh, you can do it through technology. Technology can, can help us. If people have had a brain stroke and uh, parts of the brain uh, are not functioning uh, good anymore, well, through uh, plasticity, we can reorganize. That was actually what Bakirita uh, did. Uh, and also uh, Taub in the United States, uh, when they understood that uh, if you are paralyzed at the left, you can, through reorganization of the brain, uh, find a solution that already helped a lot. But there are other, other things to, to give an idea. Uh, I, I'm writing a book and we, we are giving a number, of, uh, a number of examples regarding brain plasticity. It's unbelie unbelievable to give you an idea. Marta Curtis is an American uh, lady. She, she plays classical music. And at a particular moment in her life, they had to remove a big part of, uh, of her uh, right brain. And normally, uh, playing music, you, you have to rely on the, the right hemisphere. And what did happen? Uh, she could go on playing uh, mu music at the highest level. Nobody knew when she was a very young uh, girl, she had a health problem and the brain reorganized itself. This means that the information she normally had to put in her right, uh, in the right half of her brain, well, it, it, was, it was actually uh, put in the left part of the brain. So they discovered it afterwards. And this, is, this explained to us that whatever we try from the outside, it is actually the brain itself that will determine, determine a lot. So I, I, uh, I know all the experiments and now through, thought, through thinking they can even move, uh, make people move objects. We, we understand more about it, but it's, it's not uh, so easy to transfer it into to the reality of, of, of life. Okay. That must have been your normal wake up alarm there. Uh, for, for your day yeah, was, i was i was a little bit surprised because or it's my wife who, who is who is uh, waking up that's possible <laughs> no yeah Go like on, I, I, it's probably one of those you're still talking moments these canadians have got you on for far too long right now oh, not, not a problem make use uh, of it well we appreciate it thank you and and lastly david uh if you've got a question there feel free to unmute 
Uh, Michelle, I appreciate for everything which I believe is absolutely new for most of us. And I actually have two questions, if you may allow me. Uh, the first one is a uh, quick one. So uh, it seems like your methodology has been developed over a certain period of time. So I'm just wondering uh, when you start to put that into practice at, at what, what kind of uh, under what kind of circumstance and at what time. And as a second one, uh, you mentioned about uh, working with Chinese and who I know they are decades behind or even centuries behind. So uh, what's the biggest challenge you believe is to apply your methodology to uh, those areas where soccer is under development? Well, first, first part, I already do this uh, for about 30, 40 years because I'm a teacher and it's quite logical that when you're teaching, uh, you, you ask yourself, how can I help my children in the best way? So uh, I, I experience uh, the way they they educate me educated me to become a teacher and i was not uh, always fully convinced uh, but that's something yeah it, it has to be in your in your personality your your mindset i i was never concentrating on one field uh, i'm qualified in so many so many fields that it made me more and more curious. And that's, that explains why I could, uh, could actually find uh, good solutions. It, it, is, it is matching with what David Epstein is, is explaining in his new book, being a generalist. Because if you specialize too much, you do not see uh, all the problems. You only focus on, on a small part and you start believing that's it. And that's not a, a good way. Now, regarding the Chinese, well, the first thing you need to do, uh, and that's that's something that's the reason why I traveled a lot, and the reason why I've been acting all over the world. Uh, you have to understand cultural, social influences. If I would go to China, and this is the big mistake, this is still happening. A lot of countries still think. Okay, the best football is played in the UK or in Germany or in Italy. Let's invite coaches to come to the States or Canada and they will tell us how to do it. This is a big mistake. Because if you do not understand the culture, social environment, the way a country is organized, it will never work. Because it, it, would be, it would be too easy, copy paste. This is not correct. If I want to do something in China, the first, my first mission is to make uh, an analysis of how Chinese society is organized. And uh, I think you, you know better than I that China is a very complicated country. It's not a country, it's a continent. If you go from the East to, to the West, uh, not, not, a lot of people still think that there is one lane. Uh, you will be surprised when you travel around. This is not correct. So, but what we try to do, what I do together with the technical director, we first try to understand how do Chinese parents look to football or soccer. That's already a big problem because they are not so much interested uh, in soccer. The, the the thing they care most about is the education of their child. What will be the future of the child? Also with the one child program now, they can have more children. That changed a little bit, but still the focus is more on the school education than, uh, than sports. So we first have to understand how can we influence uh, the parents? Because the parents are uh, the pathway you use to, to influence other things. And what we are doing, what, what I'm doing right now, and it, it will be presented at the end of the year, the Chinese president will be there uh, together with our king. We first want to explain to the parents when your child is part of our 
uh, moving and sports activity, our first goal is to improve the school performance. And then it changes. Then they start listening. And that's also what Tom Beyer is doing with his program, Football Starts at Home, because few people are aware of the fact if we can show to parents how uh, daily uh, moving, moving activities, but in a joyful way, the children must have fun. We only have to inspire them, can influence their learning development. It's very important. This is something we didn't know. Uh, many times we concentrate too much on the hands. But now we know through research, if you bring in the feet, and it has to be naked feet, you actually stimulate a lot the cerebellum. The cerebellum, for many years, we thought is only, is only there to master our uh, motor uh, activities. Now we know that the cerebellum also plays a part in concentration, in cognitive processes. So if you start uh, explaining to children, also uh, play with the ball, uh, bare feet, we give you some examples. And the moment they touch the ball with their feet, it's not immediately to, to uh, lead them to, to soccer. It is actually more from the idea, how can we uh, develop or elevate their learning capacity? And then there's another thing in it. Uh, when you start doing this from three till five, six, and that's what, what I'm doing. Tom is actually concentrating on that part. We actually make it possible that a child, before it arrives in an academy or in a, in a club, already has some skills. Because the biggest problem uh, when a child goes to the elementary school or the primary school is the pressure it gets from time and space. Uh, all the rest is, is in the background. That's something you can already influence at home. But I think you can imagine if a child arrives in your training session and it already masters uh, a bit the ball, everything will be simplified. And to go back to China, if I can show you and I can uh, prove through research that, and we do this, that your child will have better school performance you will look to the problem in a different way. And then through uh, today's technology, we will challenge them. Eh? We will make it possible. They uh, meet other children. They challenge each other. Actually, we give, it, we give it to the children. And at the same time, we explain to the parents, our goal is not, in, is not at first to develop uh, top players in China. Our first mission is to elevate uh, the learning development of children. When we are on the road, we will try to find out, and that's something the, the player has to decide for himself, who wants to invest a part of, of his life uh, to become a professional soccer player. And then we connect it, and that's uh, another step, because uh, many times, and this is the problem, we know through research that, if you have a model player, it, you, I, can, I can prove it uh, with other sports, baseball, if in a small country where they have never played baseball, someone goes to a very high level. After a few years, it's the same with, uh, with uh, Jamaica, Usain Bolt. Uh, he is a role model. So suddenly a lot of young, young people want to do the same. And this is what we try to, to set up in China as well. But there's one thing in the background, and that, that uh, is the advantage of working all over the world. If I, if I go to, to Africa and I, I, I train uh, African players in Senegal, for instance, uh, for many weeks, and this player to Europe and he arrives in, in Europe, in France, and the contents on, uh, of what is happening on the pitch is not matching with what he has been doing in his country. 
it stops because mentally it will be it will block and this is what what we want to avoid so we want to set up a system in china and then we send them to a european environment that is organized in the same way so what is so important the moment chinese football player steps on the pitch after five minutes he will get a feeling i know all this otherwise it's it's again uh, a collapse of cultures because you learn to play football in china you go to europe and suddenly it's a completely different different world that is actually now <laughs> now i told you a little bit how we are looking looking to it but it is it is very interesting to to understand all that and it, it at the same time and keep this in mind the most important uh, part of life is actually from one till five we all think uh, when they are growing older that's it oh no science neuroscience is telling us watch out for those first four five six years because what you can expect of a child will be determined by the first experiences. And to tell you one more thing, the first four years, there is no conscious control over what a child is learning. Everything goes into the brain of a child in an unconscious way. And that's what happens in China, in other countries as well. But if, uh, if already the, the typical Chinese culture and social uh, ideas go into the brain of, of uh, the child, then it's very difficult to, to, change this, to change this later on. Okay. Tremendous, tremendous uh, answer. And, and I love the fact that you're investigating the culture of, of that area and then tailoring solutions to to complement the culture and to also then, you know, win over the parents, as you say. Mm -hmm. um, if there's, uh, if anyone else has got any other questions, well, put the hand well, up quick. Sorry. I will add one more thing that will oh, interest go on. Because, uh, Regarding that problem, I have an MBM Academy in New York. Uh, so I have a Belgian uh, friend, partner, and he has set up an academy according, according to my method. But there was one condition. Uh, the players that want to be part of that academy cannot pay to be in the academy. We refuse them. We, we told them, okay, you are interested. We simply want to check if you are committed enough, but your parents cannot pay to, to be part of the academy. The results are unbelievable. Already uh, high schools reacted on it. They said, but what happened here? So after some time, problem is they are winning all their games. They are uh, motivated and committed in a different way. But through my experience, I, I had a lot of uh, camps in, in the States. That system of paying is not a good system. Uh, I, I want to say, I want to say, there has to be a compensation, but if, if you block actually your influence on, on the players through, through the involvement of parents that start thinking, if I pay, I decide it will go wrong. And that's the reason why we wanted to know, let's, let's try to, to eliminate that influence and let's see how children are reacting on it. I can make possible. You can speak with my colleague. He will confirm it, and uh, it, it 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 proves again that it's a mindset. I don't want to condemn uh, American parents, and I I I, uh, I appreciate they they want uh, a brilliant future for their children. But watch out what you're doing. Eh? Uh, you have to give confidence to to a coach and to an organization. And if you only fall back on money and you start creating your own story, uh, a father, if you organize a perfect training session and you make your players playing matches, 
in one minute, a father can destroy everything. If his opinion is, if his uh, idea about soccer is different, emotionally, he can have uh, a very, very big influence on, uh, on a player. That's something we cannot exclude because that's in our genes. And, uh, but that's the reason we, we look to it uh, uh, in a different way to find out uh, what can be disturbing influences. And they, I think they call it in Canada and the United States, snow plowing. Uh, so uh, <laughs> removing all the snow in front of your child to be sure that it will be it will have a fantastic life. This is not always the, because what I experienced, the children and the athletes, the top athletes that struggle the most will, will become the best ones. It's, it's not a good idea to, to simplify the, the problem. Uh, you have to, to fight with the complexity. Okay, I wanted to tell you this because uh, uh, I am, I'm going to hit pause on that one. <laughs> and I'm going to say that might be part two. If, if we can get you back on, that would be amazing <laughs> for you to speak about that Academy as well. I don't know if, uh, if, if Dan or Sam have a question, I see Dan's hand is, yeah. uh, is waving. So if you want to unmute Dan, uh, go ahead. And then Sam Cheng for it all. You've, hello, you've got Michelle. the very last question. Yeah, hello. no, it's not going to be a question. I'm just going to say hello to Michelle. I've known Michelle for a while. I uh, am the witness. I have been to Genk and I've been to New Jersey and I um, have seen Michelle firsthand and everything he's talking about. So I'm the witness here tonight. Uh, I've been there and uh, you guys uh, heard something pretty special tonight. Anyway, Michelle is uh, a very, very unique person and uh, I respect him very, very much. And I actually have tried to uh, put some influence in Canada that his teaching should be adopted, but I have come across too many roadblocks that Michelle can talk about. Well, we, would, we were not gonna talk about that, but um, I'm pleased to meet you, Jordan, because uh, uh, maybe collectively, uh, we can make some changes, but we need we need advocates and we need people like you and all the people who are on this today, uh, because uh, in Canada we need we need help. Yeah, we're just just trying to develop the game and develop each other, right? And so if if this sparks a little bit of curiosity in some of us and and a little bit of self reflection or self awareness, then magic mm -hmm. job's done. And I think that if we can walk away from holy smokes over two hours, uh, if you can take one thing from tonight and apply it into your, your next training session when we do get back on the pitch or, or pick up a research paper or, or grab a book and, and just reflect, I think that, that we've had success tonight. But, uh, mm -hmm. but I appreciate that, Dan. Thanks for that. Okay. And then okay. Sam, I see that you've, you've got the hand up. Uh, yeah, Mich yeah. Michelle's probably <laughs> thinking, I gotta go, but Sam, I know, questions. I know. Oh, uh, no it's, more, it's more a point of admiration. I think you have an absolute beautiful mind, and I just I appreciate your research. And the one, I guess it, it's a great commentary kind of to close is as people who want to be advocates for change and want to see, you know, some of those archaic education systems, you know, both in sport context in general and, and in the greater world how would you best kind of give us advice for kind of crash course on the stigma around change or, you know, kind of influencing others to maybe not understand it fully right away, but just embrace change and embrace being ambassadors for, you know, wanting to develop the child's mind in a different way and just kind of breaking down barriers. I work with children with special needs and, yeah. um, you know, in the adaptive context, like that's, that's huge. A lot of parents are their own worst you know, enemy in the sense of the family of putting on stigma to what their child's capabilities are. So just, I don't know, in closing, I just wanted to say that I admire and um, I'm thankful for your time. And yeah, thank you for sharing a lot of your brilliance. <laughs> we appreciate it. 
I can I can only confirm. Look, uh, if you read the book of Joe Bowler, there is a, a Canadian lady uh, in the book. Uh, I can't remember her name, but she is doing a. She is actually confirming what I'm telling, and I fully agree with with what you said. Uh, we have to to convince parents to to look to their children in a different way, and we can help a lot of children because that's our main our main mission in life. Uh, if you only if you only care about uh, the talented ones and the big stars. I think uh, we are not doing the right thing. Uh, and there's, on, there's one thing I try to, to uh, explain more and more. The influence of moving on the brain is tremendous. But then you need, you need to, to invest some time to understand it. Uh, the brain timing, the interactive metronome system in the United States, I, I, I did the same in Europe. It's unbelievable uh, what you can do with uh, children having learning pro problems. But the, the big danger is when they step into a sports environment that uh, competition will, will have a too big influence. And that's what this, I already told Jordan, this is changing completely in Europe. Because I'm, I'm involved in a project in Germany, uh, I work in Holland, uh, I have projects in Belgium, uh, also in France, they are, uh, they are really reorganizing everything. No more competition till the age of 15. They want to stop it because they, they begin to understand that uh, they do not help uh, young people in the correct way. It's, it's a big surprise, but, uh, and also the fact perhaps that uh, in, in Canada, the States, uh, that you're not aware of the, that, but the dropout in youth soccer in Europe is uh, terrible. So in, in Germany, uh, thousands of children do not want to play any more football. France, the same. Belgium, we have the same problems. We have now documentaries on the English, uh, on BBC, uh, on Dutch television, where young kids are actually uh, delivering a testimony. And they say, uh, we are so disappointed about uh, our football experiences and they, they really do not want to go on. And in the UK, it's, it even ends in suicides what are we doing with children? This is not uh, the meaning of, uh, of what we have to do. Eh? But it is, it is the exponent of, yeah, uh, I call a little bit the end of the industrialization system. Uh, that means that we thought for many years, uh, the human being only has to, to, to accept one role in his life and we will tell him what to do. And uh, when he is specialized in one thing, it's up to him to make something out of his life. And we didn't look to, to the big, big picture. So I'm, 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 I'm very happy that people like you uh, assist my, my uh, webinars because uh, they understand even better what I try to, to explain. That is, uh, okay. uh, I'm going to end her there on, on <laughs> Sam's kind of beautiful comment and, and on the way that you've wrapped that up, Michelle. And, and just on behalf of, of everyone on the call, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. I think that this was an incredibly insightful uh, two and a half hours. And, uh, and I think that we truly as a group and as a collective have gotten at least 1% better. Uh, as both people and as coaches tonight. So uh, thank you so much. And I hope that you have a wonderful day today. Uh, I know that the sun's up and, and it looks like it's a bright sunny day in Belgium. So hopefully you, you've got a wonderful day ahead of you. Okay, and thank you for the interest and attention. Um, have a, now for you, it's bedtime, I think. <laughs> so uh, uh, I can't say uh, have a nice day because you, you go to do that. Okay, it but is, anyway, it is nap time. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to explain everything. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. And, and on that, we will say see you later.
Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.